Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we just wanted to do a quick uh, introduction. Um, we're a team from Cook Fox Architects and Burrow Happold uh, Engineering. So uh, from Cook Fox, it, uh, it was uh, Zach Grzbowski and myself. And then from uh, Burrow Happold, it is uh, Spring Wu and Andre Prather. Um, so they'll be uh, off speaking a little bit. Um, you know, this has been a really uh, wonderful opportunity for us and uh, I think a great uh, kind of learning experience. Um, so just to begin, uh, I wanted to talk about, um, you know, sort of where we're coming from. Um, Cook Fox is, uh, you know, firm that, you know, is, is really kind of rooted in design uh, through biophilia, a connection to nature. Um, this is uh, the terrace at our office. And, you know, I, I think part of a connection to nature is, um, you know, not just, you know, helping the inhabitants uh, of a building, but also understanding the ecosystems uh, that are, you know, whether we know it or not, are uh, surrounding us, um, you know, in our urban environment. Um, so uh, one of uh, uh, one of the things we have on our terrace is a, is a garden as well as uh, we keep uh, honeybees as well as solitary bees. And, you know, I think these connections to nature are, are one of the things that, um, uh, you know, really drive our uh, design practice. Um, you know, we're, we're not coming to Terracotta uh, with fresh eyes. We've worked on a series of buildings for Apple, Van Cook Fox, um, you know, in, in New York City and uh, further afield. Uh, but this, what uh, ACA has really sort of allowed us to do is, you know, think about Terracotta outside of the constraints of, you know, a budget, a client, uh, you know, a project, and really think about what Terracotta can do and, and its uh, kind of benefits. So, you know, just thinking about uh, some examples of terracotta where, where we started, you know, we were really drawn to sort of what ceramics are fundamentally, the materiality of them, what their strengths are, not just sort of making them, you know, look like a metal panel or, um, you know, making them act like something, but, you know, trying to understand what exactly uh, the benefits of terracotta are. And so these screen walls, um, uh, the, the one on the left, the acoustic uh, wall, and the one on the right, uh, sort of a screen wall for, uh, for light, were really, uh, we, we were really drawn to them. Um, and then also, you know, some of the more uh, performative aspects that we could, um, you know, uh, make, a, make a screen wall, make a biophilic screen wall uh, do. And so uh, the project on the right, um, the pollinator pavilion, um, was home to, uh, some native solitary bees um, and, you know, studied them. So these were, uh, you know, some of the things that we uh, kind of started off thinking about. Yeah, so the next few slides, we want to offer a little bit of a brief history as to how we arrived to our final design. Um, so from the beginning, we had the idea of incorporating a modular system that had the capacity to house certain programs. Um, to really try to activate the facade with the purpose. So the initial sketch you see on the right really helped us define this program as habitats, uh, in this case, birds, bees, and vegetation. Uh, and we we're also interested in how the pods and the apertures they create can serve both as function and aesthetic. Next slide. Uh, so a continuation of the previous slide, um, this shows just further study of apertures, screening qualities of void versus opaque, uh, connectivity and modularity. And we also studied a, a simple tile that could be rotated and has differing aperture types, which produces a very dynamic facade, uh, which is something we're really trying to go after. Um, and so through these three initial studies, we started to define a language uh, of how we wanted to incorporate the idea of a screen wall with also functioning programmatic inserts. Uh, so from an aesthetic viewpoint, we then started testing different screen patterns uh, with varying levels of depth uh, and apertures. Um, quickly had a, a graveyard, uh, so to speak, of somewhat dead ends, but found out what we didn't like and what we started to like. Um, and ultimately helped us define uh, 
uh, an intention of using the structural qualities of terracotta as a form of like a stacking block. Uh, so we basically have two components, modules and pods, and we'll take a closer look at those. Uh, so after following the pattern studies, uh, we settled on the base shape, which you can see in the middle of the screen here. Um, and really with a single aperture blocked out for the future program. Um, we took this base shape and carved out the voids uh, in order to get a screen-like quality that we were going for. And so initially we had three different modules that created the opaque zones as well as the voids. Um, but after reviewing this with the Boston Valley team, we really tried to reduce the number of modules for feasibility and economy sake, um, not just for the mock-up, but also the spirit of ACAW, which is somehow to design within a pragmatic mindset. So we got down to one module um, that gives us our voids to achieve the screen pattern, as well as the aperture for the program pods. Uh, and in the back of the module, you can see we really hauled it out as much as possible for materiality concerns, but also in planning for how the pods will be housed. So this is a matrix that outlines that standardized module, um, which you can see on the far left column, um, and how that one module gets associated with the three different types of pods. So since the overall screen pattern is defined by one module and how it's rotated, uh, the given orientation of the module is directly associated with how the pod is housed. Um, so for the plants, the pod wants to be upright to funnel water into the planter. The bee pod wants to be upside down to protect from water and the bird pod needs to be accessed from the side. So here in this diagram, you can see that logic and how it overlays um, throughout the entire pattern. Uh, as the section on the right shows, the, the module and the pod are two very distinct components. Um, in order to fasten one or the other, we used a simple bolt connection that is set in silicone, uh, and the holes for the bolts were, um, were made when the terracotta was still in its green state. And all three pods are shaped differently due to their programmatic requirements. Um, so a big design challenge was to not only make them fit within the module, uh, but to standardize that connection point um, while also maintaining access for ease of assembly. Uh, so next, I uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, pod program. So. Uh, you know, first up is uh, the bird pod. Um, you know, the, the shape of each of the pods um, is, is very much driven by the program. Uh, so the opening of this pod, uh, one and nine sixteenths, um, is designed for sort of a, a great variety of, uh, of native uh, bird species, uh, mountain bluebird, uh, great crested flycatcher. Um, and then uh, there's also, uh, when we get to photos, you'll see some of the ventilation and weep holes that are necessary for, uh, you know, provide a, a, a dry, uh, comfortable spot for birds. Uh, for the bees, um, it, it's really designed for native solitary bees, which are um, really a, a broad range of bees. Um, you know, there's sort of the leaf cutter bee and the mason bee that a lot of people are familiar with, but you know, we, we varied um, the size of the reeds uh, installed for um, you know even even greater uh, number of solitary bees. And uh, the the bees are stingless; uh, they don't produce honey, but they are uh, wonderful pollinators and really have evolved alongside uh, native uh, ecosystems to pollinate you know the specific plants of an area. Um, so it's important that you know we provide habitat for them. Um, and they use the reeds uh, to lay their eggs. Uh, so you can see uh, up in the top left, uh, they'll uh, lay an egg, uh, put some pollen, and then put a put a little cap, and then do that over and over again, uh, all the way down. So um, the ceramic uh, vessel is uh, really creating sort of a, a home for those reeds. And then the uh, plant pod um, is sort of designed off of um, a bottom watering planter that. 
you know, basically has it's a double walled uh, slip cast chamber um, that is using the bottom chamber as a water reservoir. So um, the the whole wall uh, is is funneling water into um, into the planter, and uh, when the soil gets saturated, any excess water flows into the reservoir. Uh, when the reservoir uh, gets too full, then there's an overflow in the back. Um, but when the soil dries, um, the, uh, the the water wicks up into the soil, so it keeps it uh, the, the the perfect uh, moisture consistency, and uh, uh, it's a passive way of uh, irrigating crops without sort of the um, the pipes and uh, mechanical systems that we're used to. So moving out of the glazes, um, you know, alongside um, you know all of the uh, kind of studies we're doing with uh, the the modules and the pods and uh, programming, uh, Andy Brayman uh, was working you know with us on glazes and you know really uh, worked on a, a whole spectrum of uh, different glazes for us to look at. So here are just a few that he kind of presented to us. Um, and you know, one of one of the first ones that really struck us was uh, this kind of luster glaze, this black, uh, blackened bronze um, iridescent uh, glaze that um, was was really beautiful. Um, however, it, it was completely opaque, and um, you know, we were looking for something that you know maybe had a, a little bit more movement. And um, so, uh, some other glazes. Uh, that we were really drawn to are, are these uh, these combinations of uh, whites and blues, and so um, you know this this uh, sample over here, it, the blue is actually an ungoat, so a, a colored uh, clay underneath the, uh, the the glaze, and you know we really loved the way that it was able to kind of get a broad range of effects, breaking at the corners. Sort of a gradient um, uh, in the in the glaze, and also sort of a, a single glaze application. So you're not masking, um, and you know, in in the conversation of production, um, you know, a single glaze uh, seemed like it was uh, incredibly uh, it, or, or much easier to uh, manufacture. Um, so here was uh, one of the studies. Uh, we had uh, the luster glaze and uh, some of the blues. Um, and you know, studying a, a few more uh, kind of gradient blue to white. Um, you know, we, we ultimately kind of landed here where the module uh, had the white glaze, the kind of aperture. Uh, you know, is that blue ongo with the with the white glaze over top, and then all the pods are a low fired uh, uh, kind of terracotta um, uh, colored uh, clay body. And so the other thing uh, that we really wanted to study um, were some of the ridges on the side. And so um, we, we first did a did a test where we had uh, sort of two different grooves. Uh, we had a lot of kind of sharp grooves on one side, and then we had a few more rounded grooves. And so we thought that you know maybe the sharp grooves would break, whereas the rounded uh, grooves would kind of pool the glaze a little bit more. Um, and you know we we like the kind of subtlety of the groove so much that we ended up keeping keeping both and you know keeping that um, kind of subtlety to the um, uh, to the modules. And these are some uh, uh, glaze studies. Uh, you can see how it kind of breaks differently across them and pools. And there's some kind of bluish tint to uh, some of them. So uh, we really tried to understand the interaction of the ongo to glaze. And then uh, ultimately, you know, we 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 chose this uh, this white glaze uh, over here for the way it uh, you know really played with uh, played with the light and uh, broke over uh, some of the sharp corners. Yeah. So after we settled down with the module geometry and got a clear directions of the programs, we start the design of the mockup. 
So during this phase, we worked closely with Boston Valley team to get their feedbacks regarding construction and fabrication feasibilities. The mock-up size you can see from the diagram is a nine foot four square panel, which includes 24 full or partial modules. And next. The primary structure of the mock-up consists of a two by two hollow steel section, which we saw this would be uh, sufficient to provide the rigidity we need for to hold the mock-up. And the panels is attached to the structure through anchor straps for lateral support. And next, uh, we did the uh, we did have an an analyze the structure frame to ensure the design will be sufficient to withstand the horizontal forces, which we were assumed for people pushing or during happen during transportation. Also, we have checked the frame deflection stays in the design limit with the speci specified forces. Next. So this shows the front view of the mock-up. The modules are bottled up bolted to each other from the panel. And then we introduced the new print shames to accommodate the movements and any tolerances that may have during fabrication or during the field installation process. And after several iterations, we decided to cut through the parts, as you can see along the right side of the mockup. This is better demonstrate the program that we saw within the parts from a side sectional view. So uh, the viewer can see the mockup not only from the front and back, but also from the side, which will also serve better for educational purpose in terms of how the birds and bees can potentially interact with the space. And next, please. These three diagrams illustrate the connection points that we designed to assemble the panel. The connection are either located at the center of the edge of the of the unit or the center of the leg, which would simplify the fabrication process and ease the alignment of the connection during the field installation. Also for the modules that at the edge of the mock-up, we were able to cut the modules and then rotate the parts to utilize the whole piece to minimize the waste. And next slide. So um, move beyond the mock-up, we further thought about to bring this design to apply a to a larger scale. So we were, we can inter, we were thinking to integrate this mod panel to a utilized curtain wall system through the knife plate connection. And next. So this building rendering really shows the look that we wanted to achieve, which is another layer of architectural language that could be added to the building facade that can function as a screen for privacy and also a solar shading. And it also potentially will host different species as we described before at the lower level to act as a feature wall and education de devices for the children. Next. So now we focus on the assembly. Um, here you can see the pieces um, uh, delivered by Andy to Boston Valley, um, all the shapes, the pieces that are cut, and the ones that are going to be reused for the edge pieces. Next slide. Here are the pods. Um, we have the, on the left, we have the round pod at the end, the bee pod in the middle, and the flower pod at the top, which is glazed um, for long-term durability. You can see some of the fasteners that we use to attach the program pods to the module itself and the shims and hardware that we're using. Next slide. Um, we use um, silicone sealant as a, an adhesive to help support the pods in the module and we taped them up, shred them up overnight and screw them as well. So it was just an extra um, belt and suspenders as far as adhesion. The, we can see us laying out the first row of modules, which were the hardest ones to, to install since they, they basically had to be shimmed and adjusted as the weight of the pods uh, or the modules started to affect the base. So it was, uh, we basically installed them and then had to adjust them uh, as we continued building successive layers. Next. This is a shot of the completed work with all three pods um, that we planted the pods um, we put the reeds in the in the B pods and and shim. You can see some of the shimming between all the modules. Next slide. 
here you can see the play that the module has with the backgrounds. Here you can see it in full light on the exterior. You can see how transparent it is. You can see the play between void and solid and the way the backgrounds highlight the, the pattern of the module. Next slide. Here you can see the ridges and how they pool the glaze um, kind of over the whole the whole assembly. So it's pretty, you know, it's pretty varied and as well as um, um, beautiful in terms of how the, mall, the the glaze plays along the surfaces. Next. Here you can see us inserting the pods and the back of the, the module, um, which 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 you know we tried to to ensure it was an, as interesting viewing it from the back as the front of the, the installation. Next. Here you can see Zach planting, planting the pods. And on the right, you can see the reeds installed for the bees. Next. Some close-up shots of the attachments from the frame to the modules and a cut of the plant pod, which shows the wick um, that would help hydrate the soil over time. Next. And that's it. Thank you very much. Super. Th thank you, guys. Um, we have a few questions, and I know we're, we're running a little on time here. There was lots of questions, I think, simply on the kind of feasibility of, of, uh, uh, of the biophilia that you're speaking about, whether the bees would occupy it, and, uh, uh, and, and whether that is, uh, I imagine, has not been tested yet. But uh, what are your plans for testing out whether uh, this uh, ecology could work? You know, I, I think we would. Uh love to get this outside and uh, test it um uh you know like the the, the it's, it's a good question about uh whether bees would use it you know they're very resourceful and you know there's there's no kind of true uh you know foolproof way that you can get you know a, a solitary bee to you know use use reeds but you know releasing uh Releasing some bees, you know, uh, mason bees, leaf gutter bees, uh, by the reeds, you know, improves the chance that you know they will come and inhabit uh, those reeds. Um, so, uh, you know, putting it near uh, other, you know, planted roots, something like that, would would also help. Mm -hmm. Uh, finally, guys, we, we move on to next, but I really want to get your impressions on uh, what sort of changed your uh, understanding of terracotta through this process. Anything that you can give us as observations, what, what sort of was enlightening here, um, that would be helpful. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to speak up and uh, feel free to jump in guys, if you have anything. Um, you know, for me, uh, it, it's what was really stunning was understanding the interplay of um, of the glaze, which you know is not a painted finish. It's not a like it's not a color. It's it's a thing. It's it's a material. It's it's you know minerals and glass like melted together. And so you know throughout the day in different you know direct sunlight and shadow in um, uh, you know in clouds uh, at different angles. You know it, it really has an incredible range of, of uh, different understandings, um, you know, and then also the the ability to kind of get a really deep profile, um, where, where I think about eight inches deep, and you know that that really helps with uh, shadows. Um, it, it helps with uh, giving a, a lot of depth to kind of um, how this thing looks throughout the day, and uh, and yeah. One of the other right. things that struck me was the flexibility of terracotta to achieve um, almost any shape gracefully, but also be its own unit that can support itself. So, you know, we went through with this geometry, several rationalizations of where do we thicken the walls, thin the walls, put in um, braces so that the terracotta can support itself basically and be like a building block. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, guys. It was wonderful to have you be part of ACOW this year. Uh, we look forward to your inclusion in the book. Thank, thank you. you very much.